Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on IBM Plumix OpenRisk, the topic that has just been announced yesterday. My name is Andreas, and I'm the technical product manager responsible for this product. I'm very proud today to present this to you. So thanks for having me here, and uh, thanks for being here. And today I'm presenting together with my colleague Amod. Yeah, hi, my name is Amod Bussey. I'm one of the product managers for Bluemix and also closely working on the OpenVest project. Okay. Thanks, Amod. So let's have a short look at the agenda so that you know what I will talk about today. So I will first give you a very crisp to the point definition of what OpenRisk actually is. And then you will meet Dave. So it's not Alice or Bob this time, it's Dave. But Alice and Bob have the same problems actually, so it's fine to talk about Dave. And you will learn about the problems Dave had and how Risk can help him to solve these problems. So we get to know what Risk is, how it works, what the value of Risk is, and how it compares to traditional models that we had before in the Plumix world. We will also tell you what makes OpenRisk so unique in comparison to maybe competitive solutions. And you will learn a little bit about the typical usage scenarios and the programming models. So Amod will talk about these parts. And afterwards, I will do a demo so get you know how you are really building the little building blocks part of this programming model. At the end, we have reserved about 15 minutes of time for um, your questions. So what is OpenRisk in a nutshell, in one sentence? OpenRisk is an event action platform that allows you to execute code in response to event. That's what it is, and that's what it does. It propagates a serverless deployment and operations model hiding infrastructural and operational complexity, and it allows you to just provide code that we execute. It also provides you with a fair pricing model at any scale. That means at any point in time, we provide you exactly with the resources that you need, and we only charge you for code that is being running really running. We also provide you with a flexible programming model, so we support multiple languages like Node.js or even Swift. And we also allow you to execute custom logic by making it possible for you to invoke Docker containers. We also give you a powerful tooling to declaratively stitch together your building blocks, even chain multiple building blocks together. And one of the best features of all that stuff is it's open. So you avoid, when you go with open risk, any kind of vendor login. That's the key message. And now to understand it in a little bit more detail, let's talk a little bit about Dave and his problems and how this can help him to solve these problems. So Dave is the lead architect of an online photo community and marketplace. And his company operates a platform that allows it to share and sell photos. So the users of this platform usually take photos, upload them, do some very basic editing, and then they do manual categorization by just, <coughs> by just um, assigning tags to these little photos that are being uploaded. A pretty tedious task, of course. So Dave's company is acting in a very competitive field at the moment. So a lot of similar companies are entering the market and all are, of course, trying to provide the best user experience and um, the, co the coolest features. So to remain competitive, Dave's company has to continuously provide innovations. So they've been doing some brainstorming and they came finally up with a very simple but nice idea. So they have realized that a lot of their users have meanwhile started to do use their smartphones in contrast to um, traditional cameras to directly take photos, or at least to take their tablets to organize and manage the photos that they have taken in the past. So for sure, they would all benefit from a mobile application providing them with functionality like auto-rotating, auto-sharpening, doing kind of semantic analysis of the photos when they are being uploaded, and especially the latter would relieve them from the need to manually categorize these photos. 
which they had to do before. So after they have decided what they want to build, they are starting to collect requirements. And in the past, they have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort in dealing with complex operational and infrastructural aspects. This time, they really want to do better. They want to focus quickly on developing value-adding code. They do not want to worry about things like scalability, high availability, infrastructural security. And the good thing is that risk allows them to exactly do that because it hides these complex aspects and it relieves you from worrying about these lower level details. It radically simplifies the development process by allowing you to simply do one thing that you as a developer, developer want to do. It's called coding. So Dave's company has recently shifted towards a highly agile organization and they have organized their organization in small teams that are all able to develop these little comp components, these little scalable, scalable components. And what they need, hence, is a flexible programming model and a flexible programming environment that allows them to reuse the skills that each of the single team has already um, acquired. And it also allows them to tackle each single problem that has been assigned to each single team using the best technology for this particular problem. This allows them to do so because it allows them to code in these different languages that I've just mentioned. It allows them to code in languages like Node.js and Swift. And that allows them to reuse the skills that these little teams might already have. And it allows them to develop in a fit for purpose fashion. And as I've already said, they can even go further and run custom logic, little binaries that you've packaged in a black box container to really execute um, value-adding value code. So Dave and his team, of course, they do not want to reinvent the wheel. And they do not want to re-implement solutions that already exist out there. What they really want is they want access to an open ecosystem, providing them with access to building blocks from multiple domains like cognitive, analytics, data, all that stuff, and from different vendors. That's what they actually would like to have. And of course, IBM Plumix is a bit pl big player in this field because we have all that stuff, some advertisement. Um, so in the context of open risk, we regard this openness as crucial as well. So what we what, this is one of the reasons why we made open risk, why we made open risk open source, because we want to encourage people to participate and to contribute, to accelerate development and to help us as IBM together to build up such a kind of rich open ecosystem. Having such a, building, such a building block is of course one thing, but of course you also need a tooling to stitch together these little building blocks that you already have. And this provides you with this tooling. It allows you to stitch together these little building blocks in a declarative fashion, and that means without the need for you to touch code. It allows you combining these little building blocks and even chaining multiple of them together. Building blocks that have been built in the past can even be reused and shared with other teams, which avoids that the same team has to re-implement the stuff that a different team has already done. It can just be shared and reused, a big benefit as well. So as Dave and his team um, have decided to develop a mobile application, that's what I told you at the beginning, right? They are looking for a solution that allows them to outsource compute-intensive tasks to a highly scalable cloud platform. And WISC makes that very easy for you. Two reasons for that. The first reason is we provide you with SDKs, like the iOS SDK, which tremendously eases the development process in the context of mobile and WISC. And it has support for what I've already mentioned, 
swift but swift on the server side, but avoids the need that the typical mobile developer has to learn another language when he wants to execute logic on the server side. That's pretty neat. In the past, Dave and his team have been really annoyed by the cost for operations, for operating, for operating their platform. So even in times of very low load, they had been charged for resources just idling around that they might need one day a week, for example, because then they need these capacities to handle high load. But for the rest of the week, they just are paying for over capacities. This is not a 100% utilization, of course, of their system. This time they want to do better. They want to go for a solution where they exactly pay or only pay when code is running. That should be the metric for paying. So even so, Steve, uh, Dave, and his, Dave and his team um, are already convinced that Frisk is a perfect solution satisfying their requirements. They want to remain flexible, of course. They do not yet 100% trust. And what they want to avoid is any kind of vendor login. But because OpenWhisk is available as an open source solution, this risk does not even exist. They can later on just pick this and run it on any other infrastructure. That's very cool. So before diving a little bit more into what OpenRisk is, let's classify it a little bit and understand how it fits into the Bluemix world. So OpenRisk is not meant to replace the approaches that we already have in Bluemix. They will remain to coexist. So while, for example, virtual machines give you maximum control and maximum flexibility because they allow you to do things like picking the CPU you would like to have, picking the memory you would like to have, picking the storage you would like to have, picking the operating system you'd like to have. OK, I'll stop now. Um, OpenRisk is really focusing on getting started easy, really making possible for you to do this thing that you as a developer would like to do. And as I've said, that's writing value-adding code, not dealing with these low-level infrastructural aspects. So let's look a little bit in more detail how it really works. So the events that are being used to kick off the code that you want to run, we encapsulate them in what we call actions. And these events are coming from something that we call event providers. Event providers might be services running on Plumix, but it could also be services running outside of Plumix. If a particular service has not yet been enabled for risk, we provide you with the tools and means to do this kind of enablement. So we all encourage you, of course, to help us doing this. That's what I told you at the beginning. It's open source. Participate, contribute, help us doing this. So just looking at an example, so there might be event providers like, oh, where is it? like Cloudant and um, many, many more. And especially in the context of Cloudant, what might happen is that Cloudant emits an event if data has changed in the database. So whenever you do an update, delete, create, whatever, this might be an action that happened in the Cloudant database that causes an event to be emitted. So the event then arrives at the open risk engine and depending on what we call rules, we determine the right action, the little thing that I've mentioned that encapsulates business logic you want to be executed. We execute this particular action, which might have been written in the different languages that I've mentioned before. OpenWhisk also supports a more direct invocation model. So you do not necessarily need a kind of service able to emit an event. So what you can also do is you can uh, have a web app or mobile app that does a REST call against the WISC engine to execute one of these actions directly. So just think of a very simple example. So we have here a web application or a mobile application and let's assume it is supposed to list some customer data. So what these two applications might do, they might do a REST call and they might have some HTTP GET whatever here and then that ends up at the open risk engine. And the same thing happens again that happened before when an event provider has emitted the event. So we determine based on 
what has been defined, the right action to be executed, and then the action might, in this particular example, contain code to connect, for example, to a cloud and database, and just check and fetch the right subset of customers. These applications should, in this particular case, return. That is what then will happen. An obvious question at this point is, how can risk actually be better than a traditional model? Even so, this is all cool. That is one point that we need to understand. So in a traditional model, let's stick to the cloud and example that I've just given to you. You want to react and you want to execute code in response to an event that happened. In a traditional model, what you would do is you would do an initial request that would then flow to uh, an application. The application would run on a VM or it would be part of a container or you might have implemented as a Cloud Foundry application. And it would, con it would accept the request that is coming in. It would process it. There would be some code that checks if data has been changed. And then it would return the result and it would switch into what I would call an idle mode. And then what you would do is you would start some kind of polling process. So every five minutes or something like that, you would do checking like, OK, has there been a change? This is obviously at least two disadvantages. The first is related to utilization. So even so, this application here is idling around a lot because it's just waiting for the next poll to come in. The underlying stuff, like the VM, is still up and running. And for you, that means you still have to pay. That's not very <coughs> efficient, I would say. The second problem that you have is that you are limited from a scalability perspective, because you are, of course, bound, if you look at a VM, to what you have ordered. If you need more power, you have to manually order more power to be able to handle the load that is coming in. So this can be better, because it works like what I've explained before. So we have a little trigger, and this trigger can be the event that is, having, that is being emitted by the event provider that I've already mentioned. It could also be the API call coming from a web application or from a mobile application. It would end up again at the OpenBrisk engine, and depending on the rules that I've already mentioned, it would determine the action implemented in any supported language to be executed. And then a little magic begins. We take this action, we deploy this action, we run this action, we execute the action and, and return the result, and then we free up all the resources again. And that means there is nothing idling around. It's only there when it is being used. So you end up at a 100% utilization. From a scalability perspective, the big advantage here is that you also can parallelize the, this deployment of these little actions. So if more load is coming in, we just deploy more of these little actions and execute them and distribute load among them. If less load is coming in, we do less. So in any case, you get exactly the power that you need. And that's, of course, a big advantage in comparison to traditional models. At this point, I will hand over to Amod, who will tell you a little bit about um, yeah, sample usage scenarios. All right, sounds good. Um, so basically, um, Andreas walked you through uh, a particular use case. He walked you through as to what is WISC, how does WISC compare to uh, you know, different computes that we have in Bluemix. Um, and also how it works and all. Uh, what, what we are now going to look at is what are the different scenarios where we can apply WISC. And what you have here is not everything, but these are just some of the thoughts that we have where you can go start using WISC right away. Um, you guys can go explore more scenarios that, that you may have, uh, but this is just a few things that we thought we, should, we, we can share with you. And after that, we'll jump into the programming uh, model. So one is about um, the digital app application and its workload. So let's say you're building a mobile application, or you're building an IoT application, or a cognitive application. This is a good place where you can go end up using WISC. And uh, like the example that Andreas gave uh, with Dave's team, where they wanted to do series of things uh, with services or with actions, uh, that's a good place to go use WISP because you can also orchestrate it to a certain degree. 
Um, it, you can take an example of IoT apps, right? Um, take something like your Fitbit or um, uh, some similar device. And if, if the user reaches 100K, if he wants to send out notifications or if you want to post any pictures or, or say something on the social media, uh, that's a good place to go um, use Whisk as well. Yeah, the place is really on the big data analytics place. Um, this is where, as in how your data changes, uh, you can run scripts, and after running scripts, you can have them up to uploaded uh, the data, and you can actually do your analytics real uh, run uh, real real time or near real time. That's another good example where you can go and use um, uh, OpenVisc. Um, the third example could be around you know uh, the whole DevOps and the pipeline uh, that you may have. Uh, so you put in code, you put the code from dev uh, uh, to test, and you want to send out notifications or you want to send out alerts to your QA people. That's that's a good place where you can go use Whisk. Or you're going from staging, you're going into production, and once you're into production, everything's done successfully. If you wanted to kick off a marketing campaign, send out emails or something like that, uh, those could be good places to start using um, Whisk as well. And then, yeah, I mean, microservices. That's that's an area where you know um, you can just simply go use Whisk for different components that uh, you may have. Uh, with that, we'll just go to the programming model. Um, every service um, would have events that they would emit, and these events that they are emitting, we call them as uh, triggers, which is where the word, uh, the letter T kind of comes into picture. Um, but as developers, all you need to really worry about, all you need to really care about is working on the actions and writing down your actions. This is where your programming comes into picture. And that's basically what, what's needed. And then in order to correlate between you know, the event that is happening or the trigger that gets there to what action needs to be executed, that's where basically the rules come into picture. So that's where the trigger, the action, and the rules are the key models that um, is, uh, that's, that's what contributes to this. From a developer point of view, it again just boils down to implementing the logic and the actions. That's the key piece that I want to take away. Okay, so triggers. I mean, triggers are basically your class of um, events that can happen. This could be triggered uh, coming as events from uh, different uh, services. So, like for example, a database. I go and make an update. That could be an event. And you can um, uh, that you that you can use to fire up an action, or you do a Git push or a social media push or something coming from different um, IoT devices that could lead um, to an event. Uh, so those all things um, would be your triggers. Actions is basically the code that runs in the response of the event or in the response of the trigger. This is basically the code um, that you're putting in. And this is, you can put it in JavaScript, which is what we support. Um, you know, just a simple example of uh, what it can be. It can get as complicated as possible, like uh, the example uh, that Andreas had, um, Swift clearly supporting Swift, uh, so you can put it in Swift, you can use that. Or if you're using Docker containers, that's another example that you could, um, um, that you could be, um, uh, that could be an action that goes on, okay? One cool thing here is that actions can be chained, okay? So for example, uh, going back to um, what um, Andrea said, um, Dave wants to do, when a photo gets uploaded, he wants to do uh, voice, uh, he wants to do noise cancellation, he wants to um, work on the image, he wants to do analysis, analyze it. All those can be separate actions, and those actions can be changed into, chained into one action. And when a trigger happens, you can invoke the main action, and it does all the chaining of it. Okay. Uh, rules. Rules is basically what tells you as to when a trigger happens, what is the action that you have to take. Okay. Okay. 
In terms of packages, uh, there are certain IBM packages that are uh, being made available uh, out of the box. Uh, Cloudant, Watson, uh, the weather company packages, uh, there are certain utils that are available. So that's something that's coming from IBM. Another set of open source um, packages that would be available. There will be third party uh, packages that will be available. And as in how you start bring, building your own actions and start building your own triggers, you can have your own packages. So it's kind of a model where it's not just what IBM provides, but it's also contribution from what you have from open source as well as from different third parties. Okay. So what you have seen is that risk really helps you to develop value adding code. It provides you with a flexible programming model perfect for small HR teams. It provides you with access to an open ecosystem of building, building blocks. And remember, we made this open source so that other people are encouraged to participate and contribute to help us bringing up and building such a powerful open ecosystem. We give you the tooling to compose powerful solutions using modern abstraction and, and chaining, one of the killer features I mentioned at the beginning. We allow you to share and reuse what you have built to avoid people um, doing duplicate work. We allow you to outsource compute intensive tasks by providing you with SDKs and, and, um, and, and stuff like that, that ease development. We only charge you for code being executed and we are available as open source, avoiding any kind of vendor login. Actions are executed, blocking or non-blocking, in response to events. They can be written in Node or Swift on server side and even Docker containers to execute custom logic. And actions can even be changed to orchestrate powerful solutions. And out of the box, we have support for event sources such as Cloudant and GitHub, you have seen that, um, as well as schedule actions. And we have some tooling comprised of the CLI that you've seen today during the CLI tutorial where we created the actions, the triggers, and all that stuff. We also have a REST API, and we have an iOS SDK to ease mobile development. There's one thing that you unfortunately have not seen, complexity. So if you want to try out Open Risk on your own, then you can sign up to our IBM Bluemix Open Risk offering. It's an experimental program that started yesterday and has been announced. I would be really happy if you do so and provide us with a lot of feedback, of course. So be active, um, help us helping make us this a success. Or if you want to try out our open source Open Risk offering, then just visit our developer center. There's also a lab today uh, it's at 5 p.m. in MGM in room 301. Um, I don't know if there are still places left, but step by, you will find out. And um, yeah, we are at the end of this talk. Thanks a lot for your patience. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, thanks for having me here.